All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Rianne, and um, I'd like to say that Jakub and uh, Leonard are also here. So if you want to have some uh, questions later on after the talk, feel free to also talk to them. Um, right. So I'm going to talk about Sylvester normalizing flows for variational inference. And I just want to start with one very quick slide on variational inference for autoencoders. So what we're going to assume that we're going to have a model, a joint model for uh, latent unobserved variables z and our observed variables x. And what we'd like to do is make sure that our model uh, uh, maximizes our objective function, which is the marginal log likelihood. And what we usually want to do is then just marginalize out z, but this is an intractable uh, thing to do. So often what we do is we introduce the evidence lower bound as already indicated in the previous talk. Um, where we do this by actually introducing an approximate uh, posterior Q which has parameters phi, uh, so such that the evidence lower bound breaks up in a reconstruction term and a regularizing term uh, between the uh, approximate posterior and the prior distribution over the latent variables. Now, the key thing to notice is that the difference between the lower bound, the evidence lower bound, and the marginal log likelihood is actually the KL divergence between the approximate posterior and the true posterior of your generative model. So if we maximize our evidence lower bound with respect to the parameters of our approximate posterior, what we're actually doing is minimizing the KL divergence between the approximate posterior and the true posterior. So what we're doing, right, is optimizing an evidence lower bound with respect to the uh, marginal log likelihood. But because it's just a lower bound, the actual two uh, curves don't necessarily need to, need to share the same local maximum. So what we'd want to do is make sure that this gap is reduced, and the only way we can do that is by, or one of the ways we can do that is making sure that our approximate posterior can actually approximate our true posterior as well as possible. And in order to do that, we need a very flexible uh, family of distributions for Q, um, usually more flexible than the standard choice, which is the uh, uh, diagonal covariance Gaussian. So in order to do that, in 2015, there was a very nice paper uh, by Danilo Rezende and uh, Shakir Mohammed in ICML on variational inference with normalizing flows. And um, the principle is as follows. You start with uh, uh, latent variables at zero, which you sample from a very simple uh, distribution such as a diagonal uh, Gaussian, and you apply a sequence of invertible transformations to these latent variables. So you have f functions, f1 to fk, that you apply sequentially to this variable, and then you get a sequence of latent variables that are all implicitly sampled from an increasingly more complex distribution. So because these transformations are invertible, after each transformation you can actually correspond the distribution or the density from which these uh, latent variables are sampled from just by correcting with the uh, determinant of the Jacobian of this transformation. So after k transformations, if we want to calculate the log posterior, all we need to do is calculate the log posterior of z0, the original variable which came from a simple distribution, and subtract the sum over log determinant Jacobians of all these transformations. So this is the principle of variational inference with normalizing flows. And in order to make this practical, we have sort of like two requirements for these invertible transformations. One, we'd like these invertible transformations to be very flexible, such that we don't require a very long sequence of uh, transformations because we need to apply them sequential and we can't really do this in parallel. So inflexible transformations lead to long sequences if you want to have a very flexible final posterior distribution. And on top of that, we would really like our Jacobian determinant to be efficiently computable. In general, if we have a d by d matrix, we, uh, re the complexity scales as d cubed and we'd like to make sure that this is actually reduced for our invertible transformations. So if we look at one of the two proposed normalizing flows in the original paper, um, we're going to consider planar flows, and this actually um, is a very simple flow, and it's very elegant, um, and it uh, works as follows. You take a latent variable z, and you basically take the inner product with some learnable vector w, apply a nonlinearity, before that you should have added a bias, uh, and you basically add a skip connection. Now this normalizing flow works very well, as shown in the paper, but there is one slight disadvantage, it's not very flexible. And the reason for that is basically, you can see this by trying to reinterpret this transformation as a two layer neural net with a single hidden unit and a skip connection. So every transformation you can see 
as a neural net with these learnable parameters. And because it needs to go through this bottleneck, this becomes slightly less flexible than desired, and you need a lot of them in order to create a very flexible posterior. Um, but the good advantage of planar flow is that it actually has a very simple Jacobian determinant. So if you calculate the Jacobian determinant for one of these transformations, and if you use the matrix determinant lemma, we actually get to see that our determinant actually res um, results in the computation of just an inner product between two vectors. Right, so although it is not super flexible, it's very easy to compute. Um, so that sort of like leverages that. Now what we'd like to do is generalize planar flows. And the simplest naive thing that you can do is just replace all these learnable vectors by matrices, such that you have a, a bottleneck of size M, which can be up to uh, the latent dimension D. Right, so this is the simplest idea. Um, and then if you represent this again as a neural net, what, you have, what you've actually done is basically uh, relieve this bottleneck of size one up to a, a, bottle size, a bottleneck of size M, uh, where this M is a hyperparameter for you to choose. So if we want this to work, we have to solve two issues. One of these, the first issue is that for general matrices A and B, this, in, this transformation is not invertible. And on top of that, for general A and B, computing the Job Jacobian determinants is not efficient. So we're first going to solve the second issue. We want to have an efficient Jacobian determinant. Um, so we're going to parameterize these matrices A and B with a QR and a transposed QL decomposition. So specifically, what you do is you make sure that um, A is a QR decomposition and uh, B is the transpose of a QL decomposition, and you share the Q matrices, which are orthonormal matrices. And then you use a generalization of the matrix determinant identity, which is the Sylvester's determinant identity, where you can basically switch the orders of matrices A and B. And what comes up is the fact that you need to compute the determinant of an upper triangular matrix, um, which means that you only need to take the product of the diagonal element. So we've now made sure, by parameterizing A and B with QR decompositions, that um, we have an efficiently computable Jacobian determinant. And I'm not gonna go through the proof, but you can also show that if you have some assumptions on the nonlinearity that you use and on the diagonal elements of your two R matrices, that this transformation is actually invertible. So we've now made sure that it's invertible and it's, it has an easily um, computable Jacobian determinant and it's more flexible. Um, but we've not solved one last thing we need these Q matrices to remain orthonormal during learning, right? And this is slightly not trivial. And the way we do this is we do this in three different ways. And the first option is through some iterative orthogonalization procedure, where we start with Q0, which is not orthonormal, but it does satisfy this condition. Um, and we iteratively apply this procedure to Q0 up to say QK, where the stopping criterion is such that QK will be orthonormal. And you can actually show that this converges to an orthonormal QK. So during learning, we parameterize Q0 as our learnable parameters, and we update Q0, and then we reapply this iterative procedure to get an orthonormal QK. Option two is to use household transformations to cr create an ortho orthonormal uh, Q. So basically what we do is we take Q and we construct it as a product of household reflections, where each householder matrix H um, is constructed by subtracting uh, the outer product of a vector V, which needs to be learned from an identity matrix. Um, so this, has very, uh, this is very efficient in terms of number of parameters. And here what's important is that the bottleneck is, has to be of the same size as the latent dimension. And option number three is that we don't learn Q at all. What we actually are gonna do is we're gonna fix Q alternate, uh, between different flows. So we're gonna alternate Q between a fixed permutation matrix and the identity matrix. And this we call triangular Sylvester normalizing flows um, so basically we said, in one flow we set Q to this matrix, which reverses the order of Z, and in the next flow we'll set it, transformation, we'll set it equal to the identity. Um, what this does is if you apply a sequence of transformations, on average, Z get, each element of Z gets warped equally, uh, an equal amount. And so this is a trick that's definitely not new. This was also used in real MVP and inverse outer regressive flows. Uh, and we'll see how uh, our results compare to theirs. Um, so now that we talk about inverse outer regressive flows, there is actually a really nice connection between Sylvester normalizing flows and outer regressive flows, or inverse outer regressive flows. Um, so just a quick recap, 
inverse outdoor regressive flows has the following transformations, where the i-th element of z prime, your new latent variable, is given by mu i, which only depends on the previous elements of z, plus sigma i, which has the same property times z, z i. And there's a special variant of inverse outdoor regressive flows called mean only uh, inverse outdoor regressive flows, where you basically set sigma i to, uh, to, zero, uh, to one. And it turns out that there's almost no performance difference between these two measure, uh, between these two transformations. And if you now compare this to our triangular Sylvester normalizing flows, where I alternate between these two transformations, where I've set Q to the permutation matrix or the identity, we can actually see that I can write this in the same form, right? Where either mu depends on the previous elements of Z or the future elements of Z. So in IAF, the way that, for instance, mu is parameterized as a function of Z is done through made layers, where in this case I've drawn a two-layer made with, a, with a, a large number of hidden units where the connections are masked out such that this autoregressive type of property holds. Now, if you look at triangular Sylvester normalizing flows, we do the same except for the fact that we make sure that the number of uh, hidden units is the same as the number of uh, uh, input units. And we actually uh, also make sure that we have more diagonal connections such that uh, there are diagonal connections. And IF makes sure that mu i does not depend on zi. But I guess the most important difference between inverse outdoor regressive flows, for instance, and our flow is that we make different choices when it comes to doing amortized inference. So amortized inference, for instance, for a, a Gaussian posterior does the following thing. You assume that your approximate posterior belongs to a certain family of distributions, in this case, a Gaussian posterior, and you make sure that the parameters of that distribution are functions of your input, such that when you get a new uh, input, you can quickly compute the parameters of those of the of the posterior for that input. Uh, so the distribution parameter functions of x, but if you do this for normalizing flows, you have a choice to make. What are the parameters of your distribution? We could say that, for instance, only the parameters of q zero are the flow parameter uh, are the parameters of the distribution, but we also have parameters in our in our invertible transformation between our flows. So in this case, we denote them with lambda k. You can imagine them to be these u's and w's in planar flows or a and b in, in uh, uh, Sylvester normalizing flows. And now there's two points of view. The first point of view is taken by inverse outdoor regressive uh, flows where we consider lambda k to be sort of like the same global parameters as phi. Um, and the second point of view is taken by planar flows and also by Sylvester normalizing flows where we say that lambda k are actually parameters of the posterior distribution. So we should make them functions of the input. So lambda k, we actually make sure that they are functions of the input. Um, so just to visualize this, here I've again drawn uh, IAF with one of these made layers. And what IAF does, it makes sure that these parameters in the made layers are global parameters. They're the same for every input. And in order to make it slightly more flexible, what they do is they make a latent representation of x, which is deterministic, and add it to this uh, hidden unit. So this is the way that they make it more flexible. And in Sylvester normalizing flows, what we do is we say that these network parameters actually come from another hyper network, for instance, which are local parameters, and they differ for every data point. Um, so we argue that the um, difference in performance between our method and, for instance, IF is due to this. Um, so here are some results. Um, we have MNIST. Binarized, uh, statically binarized MNIST, where the top line is a uh, plane VAE with a Gaussian posterior. Um, and then we have uh, planar flows with the second from the top, which you can clear, where you can clearly see that adding uh, more flows helps, right? And then the next three results are uh, inverse autoregressive flows, where we varied the size of the uh, uh, hidden, uh, varied the number of hidden units in our made layers. Um, and then the last four results are different versions of Sylvester normalizing flows. So the light green line is the iterative version of orthogonalization of Sylvester normalizing flows with a smaller bottleneck. Um, and then the dark red one is uh, orthogonal normalizing flows with the bottleneck, which is half of the latent size. And then we have household Sylvester normalizing flows and triangular, triangular Sylvester normalizing flows. And all of them actually outperform in terms of evidence lower bound the other flows. And if we look at the negative evidence lower bound and the negative log likelihood for 16 flows, we can see that uh, the Sylvester normalizing flows uh, 
um, have a lower evidence lower, a negative evidence lower bound and a negative log likelihood, and that the bound is actually tighter as well. Um, we've also performed uh, exper experiments on three other data sets, Frey Faces, Omniglot, and uh, Caltech 101, uh, where on Omniglot and Caltech, we can clearly see that Sylvester normalizing flows um, have the best performance. But on Frey Faces, this is unfortunately not the case. And we think that this is the case because Frey Faces actually has, uh, is a very small data set. So uh, IAF and Sylvester normalizing flows might overparameterize here significantly and overfit to the training set. Um, right, so, so we've now shown that on, say, four data sets, Sylvester normalizing flows uh, seems to perform uh, better due to a flex more flexible posterior. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you and also my collaborators for the uh, nice collaboration. Thank you.